Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you again. It's the end of this Lord's Day, and I hope that the last week has been good for you. You understand that these talks are actually recorded a few days before they actually go out. And today is uh, actually Friday, the 12th of February. And I'm not long back from Mulgai Town Hall, where I received the first of my coronavirus injections. It was quite nice, though, to begin the day with a video that was sent to me of my wee grandson, Busby, singing Happy Jag Day to you, to the tune of Happy Birthday, Happy Jag Day, dear Grandpa, Happy Jag Day to you. And, you know, it was lovely to see the, the smile on his face. I'll probably be putting that video up in some shape or form at some time in the, in the future. But it reminded me that even though we are still struggling a wee bit through this particular experience that we're sharing, but, you know, there have been happy days for us, days of encouragement days of hope and even though it's a wee bit painful getting a jag it's still a sign of hope for the future that people have been working hard to find a way through this pandemic which none of us could ever have envisaged even just a, a short time ago and amazingly you know I think I've shared with you before that the Psalms are always very close to me in my daily devotions. And today was the day when I turned to Psalm 136. And there's that simple statement that comes through time and time again in scripture, but more frequently in the Psalms, where we are called to give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. No matter what our circumstances and the people that wrote the Psalms are always very honest about the dark days and the painful days that we often have to go through. We can depend on the goodness and the love of God. And we should give thanks for every sign of that goodness and that love. So let's pray. God our Father, we thank you for the joy that family and friends can bring to us. We thank you for the benefits that flow to us from the researches of scientists. We thank you for the kindness that can lighten up our lives when we come to carers doctors, nurses, and other medical staff whose business is healing and wholeness. We thank you for the fellowship of the church, in some ways disrupted and restricted at present, but still we're enjoying it in various ways. And we thank you for people who care for us, who keep in touch with us, and in practical ways, ensure that our lives are on an even keel. We thank you that we can come to the end of this Lord's Day in anticipation of your word once again coming to us. So bless us in this short time. Enable us to have clarity in our vision of who Jesus is and devotion in respect of his ways. We ask it in his name. Amen. Well, folks, over the years, quite often people have shared with me promises, uh, sorry, difficulties that they're having at, at work. It might be that there have been new patterns of work which have been introduced. It may be that there's a, a leadership change which isn't going down too well. It may be that relationships are strained and perhaps there's the shadow of redundancy looming over 
people at any one time. But just recently I heard of a, a problem <clears throat> which I had never ever heard before. And it was this, that there was a mirror in a certain place of work, which when you looked into it, seemed to put 10 pounds of weight on you. Now, that, this, is, this, is, this is true. People were complaining about this mirror because when you looked into it, it made you look fatter. And it became known as the fat mirror in this place. And, and it was gone into very carefully. You, you know, your, the image, your image was compared with other mirrors that existed in, in the place. And there was absolutely no doubt about it, that this mirror put about 10 pounds in weight on you. Now, I don't know if you've had any experience of that kind of thing in relation to to mirrors, but you know, sometimes mirrors can be a bit of a, a challenge to you. I remember when I was undergoing my treatment that it was a family joke that I'd become a bit like Count Dracula, that I was avoiding mirrors at all costs because there were times when, because of the medication, my face was, was blown out quite considerably. And then at other times, um, when I looked in the mirror, my face seemed to have fallen in, in, in some ways. And, and then my hair fell out. So, you know, looking into a mirror was not the best psychological boost that I could, I could ever have. Well, I don't know um, when mirrors were invented or discovered, but, they are mentioned in, in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 13. That's a famous passage, of course. It is in praise of all the different qualities of, of love. And of course, people are, are interested in that, whether they're people of faith or of, of no faith at all. Speak of love and people want to know a bit more. But if you continue to the end of that chapter, you, you find Paul reflecting on the puzzling nature of, of life. How sometimes there are questions with no answers. Sometimes there is mystery with no clear revelation. He says, it's like looking into a, a, a mirror and seeing puzzling reflections. It's like looking into a mirror and not seeing things clearly. He looks forward to a day when, when that will be different. He says, now we see in part, then we will see more clearly. The then he's talking about is the life beyond this life, the life that we are promised in the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth. But What's this idea of looking into a mirror and seeing puzzling reflections, seeing things that are not clear? Well, Paul obviously is not talking about a fat mirror. In his day, mirrors were generally sheets of metal, highly polished sheets of metal. So that sometimes when you looked into a mirror, what you saw was a distorted image of yourself. And Paul's making the point that life can sometimes be like that. We have to live with a lack of clarity about certain things, but in the hope that one day there will be sharpness, there will be a clear, there'll be a clarity in the way that, that we live our lives. Mind you, the Apostle James he reckoned that the mirrors that were available to, to him in the first century AD, they, they were good enough to be able to show you when something needed to be changed in your appearance. He talks about someone who looks into a mirror and sees a, a smudge or something worse on, the, on their face, something that needs to be changed. But for some reason, this person 
although it's clear that something needs to be wiped off their face, just walks away from the mirror and does nothing about it. Does nothing about this thing that's wrong. And he compares that to someone who listens to the word of God, who hears the word of God, presumably understands the word of God, and yet doesn't put it into practice. The light bulb goes on in their mind. It lights up their, their inner being. But then they do something to stifle the light. They don't commit themselves to the change that should come about. It's that old issue, really, of putting the word into practice, something that, that Jesus used to, used to speak about. You know, I mean, he used to say in relation to some of the religious teachers of his day, he said that it, it's really no good listening to God's word, understanding God's word, even to the extent of being able to teach God's word, but not having the commitment to actually put it into practice. Now, we might say to ourselves, well, that's just the Pharisees, you know, that was typical of them. But, you know, um, I, I think that uh, we need to think about ourselves in relation to this teaching, folks, because how often, really, have we read in our Bibles something which indicates to us that we should be making some kind of change in our lives but we don't follow in that new direction how often have we listened to the preached word and we feel a prod to do something that will take us in a new direction but something within us puts the brake on we don't do anything about it. It's a struggle. We all have it. We all have it. And that's why, you know, uh, I mean, James says that those who understand and teach the word of God actually are under judgment more heavily. Because having spent time with God's word and been given the liberty to preach God's word, you really should be following in the direction that you're indicating for others. So pray for preachers. Pray for those whose business is mining in the great truths of God's word. I'm comforted, though, in the thought that the Apostle Paul had a, a struggle with this. You know, in Romans chapter 7, he speaks about how he delights to read the written word of God and how it gives him so much pleasure to read the word of God. But there's something within him that resists his putting it into practice. And if you read that, that passage in Romans chapter 7, you know, Paul, you know, he breaks out in anguish. You know, what, how, you know, how can I cope with this wretched state that I'm in? And he finds a solution in the fact that he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And having trusted in him, he's given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is able to carry us forward, to aspire to the Christ-likeness that is God's will for us all. In another place, Paul speaks about keeping in step with the Spirit. The Spirit reveals to us through the Word how God wants to reflect the very character of Christ in our lives. And he gives us that strength that we need, the will that we need to follow that pattern of living. Now, that's not something that happens in a, in a zap pow fashion. It's the work of a lifetime. 
it's something that will never be entirely complete in this life. But we can trust that this is God's great will for, for us. And as the Apostle Paul was able to, to admit that sometimes life was just so puzzling for him, there was a lack of clarity, there was a lack of fullness, we can look forward to that day when there will be completion in our lives, when it can be said of us that we've fought the good fight, that we've run the race, and now we find ourselves complete in Christ. Paul said, now we see in part, then we shall see more clearly. Now we know in part, then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. That's God's will for us. In the meantime, let's keep that aspiration bright in our hearts, folks, that when we look into the mirror of God's word, we are able to see the things that need to be changed in order for the light of Christ to shine more fully in us. Let's pray. God, our Father, we give thanks to you that you have this great aspiration for us, that you give us your spirit to set the pace for us, and that it's possible for us to overcome our resistance to your word and to become more fully in Christ. And we ask, O oh Lord, that this would be a reality, even in these days of, of restriction when our activities are held back in so many ways. Help us to understand that you're still working in our lives. You haven't pressed pause on your will for us as individuals. So we pray, Lord, that you would keep us sensitive to one another, the needs of others, and the well-being of others. Help us to hold one another in prayer at all times. And if there is anything that we can do for someone on a practical level, give us the will to see that through. Tonight, Lord, we thank you for those who will be manning the, the various hubs that, will, that are dispensing the, the vaccine. Locally, we, we think of those in the Islander Sports Centre and Mogai Town Hall and in other local places. We pray that you would sustain them. Thank you for their kindness and for their focus on particular individuals. Give them all the strength that they need for this time. And we thank you for those who have produced the virus, sorry, produced the vaccine, and are enabling us to have some hope for the future. Bless our families tonight. Bless our friends, especially those who are sick, that they'll be given all the strength and the peace that they need. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.